Hey, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for being here with me today. Um, my name is John. I am the co-founder and CEO of Alpha Lab. We are a high-frequency uh, proprietary trading company focused in the crypto and blockchain space. Uh, we're also a market maker and do venture investments in this space. Today, I wanted to share with you a little bit about my journey in blockchain and how I was initially a skeptic, but then have come to really believe in the technology and become a supporter of this space. So <clears throat> my journey starts about a decade ago. Uh, at that time, I was working for a company called Tower Research, also a high-frequency trading firm. And I had a colleague that started on his own doing some market making on Mt. Gox. He told me, hey, here's this thing called Bitcoin. It moves around a lot, but it's really expensive to trade. It was illiquid, and the exchange API really sucked. So I was like, oh, okay, interesting. Um, the next time I heard about Bitcoin was in late 2013 when I read about Silk Road and how the takedown of Silk Road had really caused a 20-25% drop in Bitcoin. And there again, I sort of looked at Bitcoin and thought, hey, this is really interesting. It's kind of an intellectual curiosity and it enables a very niche use case and didn't really think more of it. Fast forward to 2017, I had left Tower at that time time and was looking for another challenge. Uh, my co-founder and friend at the time, Michael, sent me a lot of data showing me, hey, did you hear about Ethereum? You could create all these assets and tokens on it. And look, their prices differ so much across so many exchanges. One primary example that I pulled up is this thing called the Kimchi Premium, where you're seeing 20, 30, 40% price differences of an asset at different exchanges. Coming from a traditional background, I was used to two, three basis points, and that was great. So we're talking about a thousand times the usual inefficiencies that we see in traditional financial markets. So we worked together, put up some code over a weekend, and started trading these inefficiencies, and that became an organic basis for Alpha Lab. However, on the fundamental side, I was really looking at crypto as a nice trading opportunity. I saw a lot of speculative fervor but I didn't really see much fundamentals. And when I talked to other people in the space, what I saw didn't really gender, engender a lot of confidence. I saw people trying to effectively undermine regulation, trying to characterize what basically was a security token as utility. Um, I saw a lot of shortcut thinking in how people characterize what the blockchain enabled. And of course, a lot and a lot of speculation. So in the early days, I would actually say, you know, Alpha Lab, we're not really a crypto company. Instead, we're a trading technology company that happens to focus on crypto because it's very inefficient. Today, I've changed my mind. So uh, as the economist Paul Samuelson likes to say, when the facts change, I change my mind. So what are the facts that have changed? Well, if you take a step back and look at what I'm capable of achieving today, I can, at very low marginal cost, create a token, and then have immediate access to this 24-7 financial infrastructure that just exists. This token, I can swap, I can loan, I can borrow, and that's pretty amazing. Um, it, I think it's an amazing leap forward in terms of what it means to create assets. So when I look back on my conception of crypto and the blockchain, I think what happened was that I was too focused on the irrational speculative behaviors of many of the players, and I didn't really dig deeper to find out what was the really revolutionary change that was happening. And so I want to help take you on that journey of mine to look at what actually happened with blockchain and what it fundamentally enables. So it turns out that financial speculation comes along quite often with revolutionary technology. We probably all know about the, um, the internet bubble of the late 1990s, but this has happened before. And it turns out that there was the railroad mania of the 1830s and 40s in Great Britain. So back then, the steam engine and railroads were a new invention, and it created a lot of excitement. New companies were formed, Prices shot through the roof, uh, far, far outstripping any fundamentals. A lot of investors and speculators poured money in, and lo and behold, lost a lot of money. However, the same speculation really financed the building of about 6,000 plus miles of railroad 
and really allow Britain to be at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. So the question then is, when we look at the blockchain, is it just a financial speculation? Is it just a speculative bubble? Or is there some really underlying revolutionary change that's going on? So to answer that question, we have to take a look at what a revolutionary technology is. And to me, it's something that lowers the cost of some input across a wide swath of an economy. An example, um, so, so with, this, uh, with this change, with this catalyst event, this revolutionary technology, you then have what is basically following a technological revolution where a lot of infrastructure is built to take advantage of this lower cost, followed by substitution with the infrastructure having been built. Um, a lot of people start doing things they did before, but faster, cheaper, more easily. And lastly, new behaviors start emerging that didn't exist before, uh, that's enabled by the infrastructure and the substitution that has taken place. Example of this is the printing press. So in the 1440s, uh, before the 1440s, it used to be that you had scribes that would copy text, and they could do about 40 pages a day um, with some mistakes. And with the invention of the printing press, this dramatically increased to about thou thousands of pages a day and with perfect accuracy. So what followed after is a period where a huge distribution network was built of printing shops and of booksellers. You also had basically the extinction of the scribes as a, I guess as a profession, uh, and instead a replacement of uh, print shops and printers and booksellers. But more, more importantly, it really, because books were so easy to make and so widely distributed, it really led to a boom in literacy. And it allowed um, science to become a much more collaborative affair, where scientists can now share their findings, share their thoughts in a much more accurate and cost-efficient way to other colleagues. So it really drove forward the scientific revolution. So for the blockchain to actually be a revolutionary technology, we need to think about what key input into the economy does it actually alter? Does it make more efficient? And to me, the blockchain lowers the cost of creating and working with assets. So what is an asset? Well, we intuitively know about assets. We think about gold. We think about diamonds, maybe art, stocks, and bonds. Assets usually have a few properties. Uh, assets are durable. They can't easily be destroyed. They're available in limited supply, and they have some utility or community agreement of value. And the last time that a new liquid asset, tradable asset, was created was actually 400 years ago uh, with the invention of the stock. So the fact that uh, we now have this new liquid tradable asset called tokens is quite something. <clears throat> Creating assets used to be very difficult. For example, if you wanted to list uh, equity in an IPO in a company, you need an army of lawyers, accountants, investment bankers. You need a listing fee on the exchange. Whereas, as I mentioned today, to create a new token is trivial, right? It costs less than $50, probably a lot less now that um, gas fees are lower. And with it, you already have a built-in financial infrastructure that you can leverage. Um, yes, it takes more to build the community agreement, but nevertheless, you have a lot of the operational infrastructure in place. So with our theory that the key enabling aspect of a blockchain is creation of assets, we can then try to pattern match against what has happened and try to make predictions about the future and what will happen. So one of the big implications of this is, of course, you have a huge proliferation of assets. And this is what we saw in the ICO boom of 2017, that people took advantage of this and created lots and lots of assets. They weren't necessarily high quality assets, all of them, but there were a lot of them. And associated with, with that, you saw a creation of an ecosystem of players that help people make sense of these assets. For example, research and publication companies that would write about new tokens. Uh, you have VCs that would invest in these tokens. And you have influencers and shillers who would try to promote these new tokens. Um, over time, I think what we're seeing is the quality of the assets that come to market are increasing over time, on average. And a lot of these ecosystem players are really helping in that effort. 
the second uh, implication of this is that assets move with a lot less friction. Unfortunately, not all friction is bad friction. There's some really good frictions that are in place in traditional financial systems, and the blockchain has really dealt away with a lot of them. So given how easy it is to move assets, um, you can also imagine that a lot of mistakes occur, right? Now people, now the blockchain is susceptible to a lot of phishing attacks and hacks, and even the most savvy players among us are susceptible to them, as evidenced by Wintermute's recent hack. So the key then is that we want to reintroduce uh, the good frictions into blockchain, and a lot of this comes in the form of usability and safety. And introducing the good friction, we call it the slide problem. You kind of want to have the right incline and the right material. If it's too steep and too fast, when you go down it, you get hurt, and that's where we are now. But if you adjust the pitch, you adjust the steepness, and you have the right material, then you go down it at the right speed, um, and that's kind of an ideal situation. <clears throat> the third, uh, the third implication I see is essentially faster reflexivity and learning. So when I was a kid, I really loved comic books and I would collect comic books. And comic books had this guide called the Wizard Price Guide. It would tell you how much a comic book was worth and what people were selling it for. I was always quite curious how they came up with a price. So I asked my local comic book store, they said, well, what Wizard actually does is they call up all the comic book stores and they say, hey, how much are you selling this for? And then they take an average and they publish it. And then the comic book stores look at Wizard and they take that price and they adjust it a little bit and they set up their price. So how does that work? Well, that's actually reflexivity at play. And we see that a lot, a lot faster in crypto. So in crypto, because you're issuing these assets that are very early, uh, they're not really backed by any traditional valuation metrics like price earnings or price sales. Instead, it's really governed by consensus. Um, and this consensus is influenced quite a bit by marketing and storytelling. And <clears throat> the, the interesting thing, though, is that once you put a price on a token, people start behaving as if that price is what it is. And that enables asset issuers to really run a lot of experiments. So, for example, what you see, um, the experiments that you've seen um, is things like liquidity mining, right, or airdrops. How do you incentivize the bootstrapping of a network? How do you incentivize the bootstrapping of liquidity in marketplaces? Um, you also see ways of trying to organize behavior and coordinate behavior across a much greater distribution of people in the form of DAOs. Um, so what we're seeing then is essentially the ability for us to have a pretty interesting self-contained experimental setup where you're dealing with real people and real money and, and sort of running a lot of in economic incentive design experiments. <clears throat> so going back to the stages of a technological revolution, this is where I think we are. We're still in the early stages of infrastructure building. You've had the catalyst event and we're starting to see early stages of substitution. For example, Institutional asset managers are already talking about making a small allocation into, um, into cryptocurrencies, into crypto assets. And you're starting to see early stages of really people talking about tokenizing real world assets like real estate uh, or shares uh, onto the blockchain to take advantage of its lower transaction costs. So in summary, uh, I now really firmly believe that the blockchain is not just a speculation. It's not just a financial speculation, although there is still a lot of that around, but that it really is a revolutionary technology. And that is it. So thanks for coming. Um, so, oh yeah, so sorry, today, today sort of I say, uh, whereas before I told everyone we're not a crypto company, today we're very much a crypto company and a technology company, uh, but that's just to say that I'm repeating myself. Okay, and I uh, just wanted to say thanks to uh, Julia, our head of ventures, and Stephanie, our head of marketing, for helping me put together the slide. It's all their work. Um, but thanks for your time, and thanks for coming. <laughs>